very good morning it's Penuel the black pen earlier on this week I dropped an interview between myself and Bianca Costa where she was making an honest and earnest appeal to a Twitter profile called Chris Excel to please change the profile picture because it is her picture and it has affected her life in a negative way to a point where she's gone for therapy she hasn't been able to make money with certain deals etc and what's followed on from that interview over the last couple of days is she has been attacked on Twitter and other social media spaces, including some of the comments under that video. I've been attacked um, by Chris Excel, by some of his fans and his what I call a mob, um, by other people on social media, including including Nota as well. And it's led to a couple of conversations in some of the circles that I'm in. And it's it's reminded me of some of the thoughts that I've had that I normally keep to myself now. You know, a couple of years ago, I used to be more controversial and I used to be more aggressive in, in my delivery on certain topics. I, I try now to be more considerate, to be more understanding. And even with the words I use, I try to ensure that I speak directly to the people I need to speak to. So this video is not to all <laughs> South Africans. This video is not to all black South Africans. This video is not to all black South African men. This video is to a specific group of black South African men. Understanding that what I'm going to speak about isn't just a black South African men issue. It's an issue of a lot of men around the world. I believe a lot of men globally have dropped the ball. What I mean by that is a lot of men don't really know what to do in society anymore. They've become emasculated either through their own efforts and shortcomings, through circumstance, uh, through oppressors, um, through a lot of really evil women. Um, but they failed to reinvent themselves and to find a way to win. I've made videos in the past asking black people to hold themselves accountable for the poverty and the suffering and the struggling that they have. And I've offered solutions to black people of how to fix this. A lot of people have said, I hate black people, which is rubbish, frankly. A lot of people have said, no, but you're too harsh. You seem to not understand the reasons. I understand the reasons. I'm black. I grew up black. I've got parents that have suffered and struggled. My father used to transport weapons during the struggle. My mom has been called a kaffir. I don't know how many times. I've been called a kaffir so many times at school and other spaces. There have been spaces that a person can't get into and can't be treated fairly because of the color of their skin. You know, you grow up. In townships in rural areas I visit my extended family visit my grandmother my grandparents at least on my maternal side and my paternal side I've used a long drop toilet we've had to defecate in the mountains we've had to fetch water from the rivers I've I've had to visit family where they still use oil lamps I have felt apartheid I have felt the consequences of apartheid and even today I see the devastating effects but we need to speak about accountability because the idea of being a constant victim and a constant complainer and a constant whiner is what will ensure that you'll never get out. Black South African men, a group of black South African men, a large group, are the bottom, are at the bottom of the food chain. They are the lowest level of man. And again, I'm saying this because I'm a South African and this is what I see in my reality. It may apply in other places. It may apply in other African countries. It may apply in some countries in the Americas, some countries in Europe, some countries in Asia. Where in some of those places, there's a lot of poverty. More poverty than we have in South Africa. But if you look at Indian Muslims in South Africa, if you look at white Jewish people, if you look at white Afrikaners, if you look at white English people, and then if you look at some of the foreigners that come here, the Chinese, some of the Indians that come here from India, some of the Bangladeshis from Bangladesh, some of the Pakistanis, some of the people from Sri Lanka. Then you look at some of the Africans that come here, the Zimbabweans, people from Lesotho, the Swati people. These are just some of our neighbors, the Tswanas from Botswana, Mozambique. You look at the Zambians, you look at the people from Malawi, the Malawians. You look at the Congolese, you look at the Ghanaians, you look at the Nigerians. You look at the Egyptians, 
that come here to South Africa. And then you compare them. I understand they are foreigners. I understand they are part of a unique group because they don't represent the people, the average man where they come from. So the Nigerians in South Africa don't necessarily represent Nigerian men in Nigeria. Nigerian men in Nigeria might be really poor and struggling and suffering. And the Nigerians in South Africa are industrious and innovative and, and can do things. I mean, you look at Elon Musk. You look at uh, Patrick Sunshion, the wealthiest medical doctor in South Africa, I mean, on the planet. You look at Trevor Noah, you look at Black Coffee. Um, you look at some of the soccer players, oh, Percy Dow, Quentin Fortune, Benny McCarthy, Lucas Khatebe. You know, you look at South Africans that have gone overseas to Sombelu, of course. South Africans that have gone overseas and done amazing work and achieved great success. Those ones are the extreme outliers. Talk about other South Africans who move to the United Arab Emirates and work. Some of the South Africans in Asia who are teaching English. Some of the South Africans in Europe who are working there for certain companies. Some of the South Africans in the United Kingdom who have started businesses. Of course, at high levels, you've got Dow Stain, you've got Donald Gordon and the likes. You look at South Africans that have moved to the Americas to go and work there to go and start businesses. Those are obviously not ordinary representatives of South Africans here. But here we are now and black South African men are watching poor men from Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique come to South Africa where they don't get free houses. They don't get um, free schooling for their kids. They don't have grants. They don't have all these nice opportunities that a black South African man has because of a South African ID where you can access CIFA, NEF funding, where the government constantly has programs to educate, to upskill, where you can get a free house, where your kids can study for free and get an education. Not a great quality education, but an education and get fed. And those men come in with none of that. The Pakistanis, the Bangladeshi. And they come here and they live in spaces and they, through industry and innovation, sometimes crime, they pull themselves up from dirt to build businesses, spaza shops, hair salons, uh, car workshops. And they work every single day and they make money. Some of them, of course, are involved in drugs. Some sadly run uh, prostitution brothels. Some of them probably are involved in human trafficking and some other crimes, cash and transit heists, of course. We cannot discount that. But some of them, we see them. We see them in their businesses every day. We, we see them because we're there buying from them. Those are people that have taken accountability for the horrific circumstances in their life. Somalians, Ethiopians. They left their areas of oppression and they said, I will go and find a better life somewhere. It is the biblical story of Moses and the Israelites who said, we will walk to the promised land, but you must work. Black South African men historically have lost, lost. We had a small group, not a large group, small group of Europeans that came, the Dutch, some French, some Germans, the British, Portuguese, came to South Africa, small group, excuse me, and they managed in their ways to come and to have conflicts, wars, skirmishes and to fight the natives who were sadly using more primitive weapons spears the shields you know the nokiris and they lost and we ended up becoming a british uh, colony and then over time the afrikaners who were a merger of the dutch french german and others they came together and they said but the british are treating us like second class citizens and they're their own a biblical Moses moment called the Four Tracker Movement and which led to ultimately the Anglo-Boer War which we call the South African War because it was more than just the Afrikaners and the English. It involved a lot of black indigenous people as well. And they managed to then begin running the country under the National Party and they implemented apartheid which was oppressive, more oppressive than British colonization to the black natives of this country and to the coloreds who became this new group that was the product of white people and black people having either consensual sex or rape. The victims, the colored nation. Then the black people decided to do their own, have their own Moses Israelite biblical moment and they fought against apartheid and where the ANC leading, 
when other political parties, where the IFP, where the PAC, where others that fought and apartheid ended. Now, when you look at that, number one, the land was lost. Lost. White people, and I know many black people attack me for this, and it's fine. It's easier to be a victim. White people did not steal land in this country. Black people, when they moved from up north in Africa to come down, did not steal land in this country. When I move from Newcastle to Johannesburg and I settle somewhere, I'm not stealing. You can buy land. Are they through bartering? We will barter and you will give me a piece of land. Or through me working for you. And then maybe you give me money or you pay me through land. Or we can fight and have conflict. And the person who wins gets to have the territory. This is how the Zulu kingdom became so big. This is how King Mushesha managed to build a nation of the Basutu in Lesotho. This is how other nations on the African continent in Europe, they have been fighting Europe from back in the day with the Roman empires and the Greeks, etc., same thing in Asia where we still see today, we've seen the fights between North and South Korea. We've seen China that has fought for certain land. We seeing similar things in with Taiwan as well. We are seeing Russia and Ukraine. We saw America go into the United States of America and then go and almost wipe out, the, uh, wipe, out wipe out, sorry, the natives. There have always been fights. There are fights to this day. There are black people in South Africa fighting over taxi routes over tenders, over territory. We don't say it's stolen. But when you are a victim, it is easy for you to not take accountability and say, my ancestors fought the invaders, the foreigners, the colonialists, and they lost. Now the question becomes, how do we fix this? How do we get that land back? Number one, you can buy it, like I said. And there are a lot of black people in this country, black men who are buying land and who own vast uh, tracts of land. There are many black people who go and they conquer land. What we call illegal occupation. It's illegal because the people who came and took land in this country came and set up laws to protect their loot. But there are black people who are saying, we will not fucking hear from you. We will go and occupy land forcefully and take it back. And they conquer in their own way. But then there are people that just whine. You've got a political leadership. People like Cyril Ramaphosa, Tokyo Sekhwale, and other ANC leaders who have huge game farms, who have huge farms, they got to get their land and their families live very comfortably. Then you've got the rest of the black South African men who are whining, who have no land. And who, as I said earlier, all these foreign people come in. And not only do they come in and, and enjoy the spoils of the economy and make money, they come in and they enjoy the spoils of black South African women. Where black South African women are dating and marrying Zimbabwean men, Swati men, Nigerian, Ghanaian, Congolese men, Namibian men. Because they feel that South African men, black South African men are weak. Black South African men don't have land. And even some of their kings are not willing to dismantle trusts to give them their land. All those black South African men would rather live in squatter camps in the cities than go and work the land back home. And use their hands and have children. And say we will work this land like our forefathers before us. We will have goats and sheep and pigs and chicken, uh, chickens and cattle. And we will, I will send you my children to go and learn in the schools out there so that you can come back and develop property. And so that we can set up enterprise and business and we can thrive. But they live in squatter camps. They beat women, they rape women. They sit on street corners begging for jobs. Then some of them sadly sit online on social media on places like Twitter and they follow pathetic misogynists and they go around bashing women because now when you can't fight the white man who has conquered you, who continues to conquer you today because you beg him for a job and for a seat at the table, when you get dominated by Zimbabweans and other foreigners, you get xenophobic and you want to find the weakest link. And you want to beat them and tell them to go back to their nations. When you're not willing to move back to your village, which is also poor, like a Zimbabwe, like a Malawi, you're not willing to develop that. You would rather go be squashed in a Joburg, in a Durban, and be there and complain about white people and the foreigners. Because you don't want to go and develop your land. Some of it you cannot claim back. Your kings are living lavish. 
while you're suffering. But you get online and after you failed all of that, the next week, person that you can bash is your woman. We're beating up black women. We're raping black South African women. We're living off black South African women. We get drunk. We get high. We're on nyaupe and other drugs. We steal from black South African women. We hijack them. We break into their houses. We blame them for women empowerment when all they did is they fought to be heard. Instead of working with them, we blame them for being empowered. And we feel weak. And we bash them for being rich and successful. Because we cannot take accountability for some of our weaknesses and shortcomings. And again, I'm not speaking to all black South African men. There are amazing black South African men who are doing amazing things, who are great fathers, great husbands, great sons, great brothers, who are building businesses, who are acquiring land, who are creating jobs, who are educating, who are preaching, who are ensuring that their boys and other boys in the community are being uplifted and empowered, who can work comfortably with women, who work comfortably with strong women and are willing to even follow the leadership of women, who are willing to be business partners with women, who travel the world and bring knowledge and skills and resources back to the country. But there are these constant victims, whiners, complainers, and we see them manifesting. And some of them pretend Andrew Tate is their hero and Jordan Peterson is their hero, and Kevin Samuels is their hero. But they're pathetic because they are not willing to put in the work that these men put in. Andrew Tate, Cobra Tate, Top G, works with his brother Tristan. They are showing the power of brothers like me and Penson. They work, you work, they work together as brothers and they push enterprise. You may not like some of their businesses, but they work. They don't sit every day on social media whining. They're working. And some of us are here trying to inspire and motivate. And we work with people from different races, different backgrounds, different nationalities to show you the power of working with people that are progressive. And we criticize. We will never stop criticizing because this country is unfair. It took criticism for the ANC and other black groups to fight against the apartheid regime. It took criticism and, uh, from, the, uh, from the Afrikaners to fight against Brit uh, British uh, domination and oppression of the Afrikaans people. It takes criticism, but then you have to put in the work. We're at a point now where good black South African men have to fight this horde of useless, pathetic black South African men who are constantly whining and bashing women and bashing other people because they refuse to wake up in the morning, to go and educate themselves, to get on social media and read up on Wikipedia, to watch YouTube videos, to go on the Khan Academy, to do courses on Coursera, to read books, go to a library, read some books, read some books. They refuse to do that. They refuse to go and start businesses. Uncomfortable, difficult, in your own house, selling cigarettes, selling uh, food, selling tinned foods, selling alcohol, even if it's illegal. You're like, I will not get a license. It took crimes what we call crimes today for the British to dominate in this country. It took crimes for the Afrikaners to dominate in this country. It takes crimes for illegal foreigners to come into this country and dominate. Black South African men will need to, at times, commit crimes to be able to pull themselves out because the system is not fair. But you need to fight, push business, break, bend certain laws, Make sure you're getting the tenders. You're getting the funding. Make sure you're occupying some of the highest seats. But once you get in there, once you get in there, put in good work. Once you get that tender, do such an amazing job. We speak today about the apartheid regime, how horrific they, are, they were, how they committed crimes against humanity, especially against the black people in South Africa. But we like, they built such amazing infrastructure. They built ESCOM and CESOL and TELCOM and ESCO. They got in through malicious, horrible means and they put in work. When you look at the Pakistanis in this country, the Somalians, the Ethiopians that run the spaza shops, they came in dirty containers, garages, back rooms, selling. Today they own cash and carriers and wholesalers. Soon they will be getting into farming and manufacturing and other enterprises. 
You look at some of the, even Nigerians and other people who have come into this country and sold drugs, sold drugs. And they've taken that money from the drugs and they've gone and they've built hair salons and car workshops and they've built supermarkets and other businesses that are clean. It's money laundering, of course. They, they, they were struggling here. No one was going to give them a job. They were here, some of them illegally. So they were like, we will commit crimes because America was built off crime and slavery. Europe has been built off plundering and exploiting from other nations. The Zulu kingdom has been built off the bloodshed of destroying and defeating smaller tribes and consolidating power. If you look at some of your favorite businesses, big monopolies, it is because they've crushed other small businesses. They've broken laws. They've paid bribes. Look at Glencore, the largest commodities trading company in the world. Look at the big pharmaceuticals that constantly break regulations. And they themselves commit human rights violations. Black South African men need to catch a wake up. The world is constantly watching. We are a global village now. Imagine. Imagine how embarrassing it looks having in your own country. An economy that is run by white people. Jewish, English. Afrikaans. Today, Indian Muslims as well. That's your mainstream economy. And a lot of foreign entities as well. Then you've got your informal economy. That is run by Pakistanis, Bangladeshi, Zimbabweans, Nigerians, etc. Your black women have to go and beg any of these other groups for jobs. Because you cannot employ them. Even in the, their homes. If you look at the Indian Muslim man. His woman submits to him first. Before going anywhere else. The white Afrikaans woman. The white Jewish woman. Then you look at the black South African woman. And how. Even if you marry her. She has a higher authority figure. That is not you. That is her boss. Who might be a white man somewhere. Maybe a black Indian man somewhere. When you tell her this weekend. You are spending time with the family. She says I have work. And unfortunately, I have to work because you're not bringing in enough money. I need to bring in money so that we can feed this family. We can pay the bond and we can take the kids to school. Until black South African men wake up, until black South African men seriously begin looking to set up enterprise, begin looking to develop their tribal land, their state-owned land, and then look to acquire legally or illegally. I personally don't care. But just show some balls. Show the world that you are a man. You deserve to be something. You deserve to be respected. There's nothing stopping you from being looked at like a Vladimir Putin. Being looked at like a Mao, like a Xi Jinping. People like Robert Mugabe. Men. Real men. It starts with you and your family. It starts with you and your household. How do you carry yourself? What work are you doing? Do you spend time with your children? Are you educating and uplifting and investing in your children's development? Maybe it's time to change your belief system. Maybe your culture and your cultural leaders are not strong and they have not been able to build systems that allow you to win. Maybe your church group is not allowing you to win. Maybe you need to convert to Islam. Maybe you need to uh, join another Christian denomination. Maybe you need to go and join, even as a black South African man, the Afrikaners, be part of Afri Forum, and be like, the Afrikaners are winning. I want to be part of them. I want to be a boor. I want to farm. I want to manufacture. My children will prod, etc., but we will win. We will be strong. They'll play rugby. They'll eat polto and braai, and they'll go to the farm, and they'll go hiking, and they'll wear khaki, but I'll be part of a winning group. Maybe I'll join the Jewish people. Maybe I'll be Jewish and, and read the Torah, go to synagogues, Study Hebrew. And at least I'll be winning. I'll be involved in, in enterprise and business. And people will call me as shrewd and as stingy as a Jew. But I'll be like, it's fine. I'm winning. I convert to Islam and I join the Muslims. And I pray every day. And my boys go to Madrasa. And I go to the mosque. And I learn Arabic. And I read my Quran. And I ensure that my woman or my women. Because Islam allows a man who can afford and provide to have four wives. And they will be then, they will submit and we will work as a family. Maybe I must join another group. 
that is winning, that is dominating. Understand as well that black South African men are not homogenous. We're not one group. We are so different. Race is not a value system. I'm speaking about Indian or Arab Muslims. I'm not speaking about all Indians. If you look at India, there is poverty there, boy. I'm not speaking about all white people. I'm speaking about white Jews. I'm speaking about white Afrikaners. Remember, the Jewish people are the people that were oppressed and murdered by Hitler. That have had to move around the world like immigrants, like foreigners, probably illegal, a lot of them. And they settled and they built enterprise. I'm not speaking about all white people, I'm speaking about all white Afrikaners, a specific group that left Europe almost as second class citizens there, came here and built themselves up. When I speak about Nigerians and the Congolese and the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshi, in their nations there's poverty and there's suffering, but these guys came together here and they did something. Being black is not a value system. What are your values? What do you believe in? And can you find a group or can you build a group that has that value system so that you can win? I am appalled, disgusted, embarrassed, shamed of all the pathetic, disgusting black South African men who jump on Twitter every single day so that they can bash women. They can attack women. There's one thing, holding women to account for why they have absent fathers for their kids, why they are constantly aborting, why they are finding themselves being oppressed and beaten and raped and, and being stolen from in certain spaces. Women have to take accountability. Black South African women, some of them who are scammed by the Nigerian men and the Zimbabwean men, black South African women have to take accountability. They also have to look at themselves and be like, why are our black men like this? How are we raising our sons? How are we helping the black South African men to win? And they also mustn't jump on Twitter and bash black South African men every day. Because they've been there with us while we've been losing. But the black South African men in particular, who are scared of taking on this puzzle shop industry, because they will fail. Who are scared to take on old, old ANC leaders, because they will fail. Who are scared to take on wealthy Jewish Muslim business people here because they will fail. Who are scared of Sadek brothers and sisters and African brothers and sisters because they will lose. They decide to jump on Twitter and bash black South African women because it makes them feel like a man. It's pathetic. It's embarrassing and we need to fucking stop. I urge all of you again while I'm here to please ask Chris Excel on Twitter to please change Bianca Costa's picture. It's a small appeal but again because it's the little bit of power and domination over black women that some pathetic men have they carry on and other men clap fathers husbands brothers they call him their president their king applauding i must see him but bullshit guys catch a wake up catch a fucking wake up and be accountable for the misery in your life Make money, work hard, be a good partner to your woman, be a great father to your children, be a great community leader, rise up and be someone, be something, have dignity. Freedom is not given, we had Freedom Day yesterday, freedom is not given, it is taken, wealth is taken, your dignity is earned. I believe in you, I love you and I hope this video will speak to your heart and push you to become a better man. Pin you on the black pen. Cheers.